All right, so why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, uh, as you can see, uh, we have um, Mirat Okadan from India, uh, who's going to be talking. He's a, a, a member of the technical staff, principal member of the technical staff, um, Microsystems s &T, what is that? Uh, Microsystems Science and Technology. Science and Technology at Sandia National Laboratory. So there's a relationship between those two um, organizations. So great. And um, so he's in, uh, doing work in the very interesting area of, of basically neuro-inspired computation. So um, uh, there's a lot of interesting things that have been sort of evolving recently in that area. So I'm looking forward to what you have to say. And uh, welcome. And uh, without further ado, great. Thank you, Vince. Actually, uh, thank you for the invitation. I really sure. appreciate that. Um, so what I'd like to do today is uh, give you uh, a, a brief overview of what we're trying to do in your inspired computation. And again, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll get into the details a little bit further in the presentation. But what I'm going to try to do is give a very broad overview and pick a few things to, to kind of dive into deeper. Um, so with that in mind, uh, that's end at the beginning, so it's nice. <laughs> Um, I, I'd like to, at the beginning, tell you what our goal is, what we're trying to do with neuroinspired computation. Again, neuromorphic computing, you, you can change the name, but basically the, the, the goal, what we're trying to do is, as stated this here, analyze, predict, and control systems in ways that we cannot do with conventional computing. So again, uh, if you're coming from electrical engineering, computer science, that might mean a little bit different things. If you're coming from neuroscience, again, it might be a little bit different. Um, and, and we'll get into those details a little bit more. Um, what we're, one of the key things we're trying to do is predict the future. In the sense that you, you know certain things are going to happen a certain way. How can you make those predictions better? And, and that, that will, uh, I'll also talk about that in a little more detail. Um, I also wanted to let you know about a workshop that we've been holding for two years, and actually it's coming up on its third year right now. It's going to be at the end of February, uh, February 23rd, 4th, and 5th. Um, actually, if you'd like to look up the website, the agenda, and the goals for the workshop, what we're trying to do. Actually, what, what I'm going to talk about here, uh, there are lots of different points of view that are presented, uh, represented at that workshop. The, the presentations have been videotaped, so you can kind of go through the presentations and kind of look at things at, at, at your pleasure and leisure. Um, so, with that, what I'm, uh, what I'm planning on doing is, is trying to tell you a story, and hopefully a mildly entertaining one at least. And for that story, here's the map. So it's going to be one, two, three, two, and one. Just, just a physical outline. So one, existence proof, two key functions, three ways to build it, whatever it is, and two things to do with it, and then one final question. So let's start with the uh, existence proof. And that's, that's actually what's driving all of this. What gives you your biggest survival advantage? So I think this is going to be something that we will not argue too much about, or if we do, let's save it for, for after the presentation. <laughs> um, it's your brain. What, what really controls you, what lets you do things in, in, in the disco world, is your brain. Space that, that you're in. Um, so this, this is the 
again, the, uh, the, 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 the talk, the TED talk that I'm uh, referencing here by Daniel Walford, it's actually one of the best TED talks I've ever seen. Um, I highly recommend it, about 20 minutes. Um, and it really goes through some of the details of uh, this point of view of what the brain really does as, as a control system for your body. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not going to delve into that too much here, uh, but I'll, I'll link this to the rest of the talk as, as a control system and what we might be able to do like the brain. Uh, so with that existence proof of the brain, what are the two key functions that the brain performs? What does the brain do that's really, really <coughs> critical? So, again, in, in, in the uh, style of a story, this is you or any other human or any other being for that matter. And this is one of the two key things. It lets you, the brain, your brain, lets you predict how things are going to happen. And that really is enabled by the ability to learn and then predict the future. So you know what you need to do to avoid becoming somebody else's food. And you also learn and then predict how to get the food. So that is survival. That's how you get access to energy, so you can then go do other things that you need to do, which is, again, capture more energy and then do other things to survive. That's the first function. The second function is this. The things that you've learned as an individual, you can actually pass them on to another individual. So then you can perform those functions a lot more efficiently as a group. So you can get access to more food, and you can also survive better. Uh, and if that op if that other individual ends up being your offspring, that's actually the beginning of civilization. So you can actually pass on your knowledge, your experiences, to the next generation without that generation having to do all those functions by themselves and learn everything on their own uh, from from the start. So that's second function to communicate. So the first one is to learn and predict. The second one is to be able to communicate those things, whatever the, the things that you've learned to another individual. So those two functions, how does a brain do that? How does a neural structure actually have the capacity to get input from the surrounding environment build those internal representations and then make predictions about what's going to happen next. And not only that, be able to impart that knowledge, that information to another sentient being. One of the key things, one of the very critical things is how that information is represented in the first place in the brain. It looks like that representation is very different than what you might consider the conventional representation in computing. Um, which, again, in conventional computing, you have ones and zeros, you do symbolic manipulation, you do symbolic computation. In neural systems, the information seems to be represented in, sp in sparse, uh, hierarchical, spatio-temporal patterns uh, that actually have that innate prediction capability built in into that representation. So, again, I'll, I'll uh, get into more, more details later on. But that representation scheme also lets you store, process, and recall that information in very different ways than how we normally do it with our conventional computing machines. To, to make that point a little bit further, what your brain is doing is not what a calculator does, which all computers are. You're not solving partial differential equations, or you're not doing algebraic manipulation in your head when you're Avoiding, avoiding a rock that's been thrown at you or you're trying to throw a spear. That's what we're doing, it's just in an in analog way. It's just kind it's of a question true, true. It, it, It's analog, but the, uh, this, this, this might get into a little bit deeper discussion. So to, to, um, 
what we've come up with as math and physics is a way to describe the, the, the physical world around us. So math and physics, true, the partial differential equations are a way to represent how physical things behave. But or the physical set of set things is a way to represent the partial differential equation. There is no difference between those. I don't think uh, okay, we can so leave it. Let's, let's get into that a little bit of detail. But, uh, there, so maybe there isn't in terms of what they are in the end, but the way they are in, represented in your yeah, neural it's a structure. It's representation of the same thing. It's a representation of the same thing, but the way they are done, the way the function is accomplished in terms of how you predict this rock is going to move yeah, over yeah. here, they, they are different. In, in the end, it's the same thing, but the way they get instantiated in your neural structure is very different than what we do in the machines. So I, I think that's that's something we, uh, we can delve into deeper later. So, so let's say those two key functions, being able to predict and being able to communicate are, are what the brain is doing, and, and you have to be able to potentially do those in a very different way uh, to, to go forward uh, beyond what we do with our conventional machines. So, what are the three those What are the three ways of instantiating that function? How can we actually accomplish these functions? So, let's say computers are there; they're available. We have them, um, and we want to use them to build a neuro-inspired neuromorphic system, basically trying to represent the things as they are represented in a neural system, and get get similar uh, performance characteristics. So one way you can do it is in software, um, just define the equations, come up with very clever algorithms, and let them run on the latest and greatest servers and, and, and computing systems that are available to you. That's what's being done in many, many projects around the world, uh, mostly uh, around deep learning, machine learning kind of approaches right now, um, and there's a lot of effort and a lot of resources dedicated to that in places like Google, Facebook, the Human Brain Project, and, and, and many other educational institutions. The other way, one other way you can do this kind of computation is in a, what I call a tweaked digital system. So you start in software, you figure out the algorithms, um, and put them on the fastest machines available. But you do realize that there are certain bottlenecks in the way you do conventional computing. Um, so you figure out ways to get around those bottlenecks, which might require some new devices or new architectures, but still in the digital computing realm, you're still doing symbolic manipulation, standard computing approaches. Um, and that, again, is being very heavily uh, investigated and it's being developed in many places using GPU clusters, FPGAs. Uh, there are novel devices that people are putting on um, standard CMOS to, again, to get those additional functions or sort of accelerated functions in information computing. And a third way you can achieve those functions is actually what I'm going to talk a little bit more about. You can actually build a novel architecture that does that sparse spatial temporal representation innately in the hardware. So it's, you're not trying to use a stored program computer. You're not trying to use a standard computer to achieve those sparse spatial temporal representations. But it actually is, um, the data representation is instantiated in the machine itself. And uh, that potentially uh, would allow us to build the state machines or things that have been uh, elaborate a little further on reservoir computing uh, and, and some of the other approaches that are coming up. Uh, so now I, I've given you those three different ways of building a system that can do neuromorphic computing or neuroinspired computing. I'm going to give you a little bit more detail about why the third one, actually a dedicated system that does a sparse spatial temporal representation internally is likely the, the way to do it. It actually has to do energy efficiency and, and speed. So take a neural system, um, assume we 
each neuron has 10,000 inputs and 10,000 outputs. And how can you do that in a digital system? You have to have 10,000 addresses that you're going to get input from. Put, the, put those inputs into a single unit. Do a calculation and generate a single output, which is a spike. And then route that one output to 10,000 elements in the rest of the network. The only way you can do that in a conventional machine is by packet switching. You can't wire 10,000 things to one unit and then wire that thing to 10,000 others physically. You, you just physically run out of space. There is no way to do it. So the conventional electronic way of doing it is you do address schemes. So you have you take 16 bits that will represent the 10,000 inputs, and then you have another 16 bits to represent what the output addresses are. You take those inputs in, do your calculation, and then deliver that one bit of information, basically a zero to one transition, which is the spike, uh, with those 16-bit address overhead, basically. It takes on the order of tens of picojoules for that function. Just taking the inputs, doing the calculation, and delivering that one bit of information out to 10,000 other outputs. And it's about 100 times slower than real time. So if you're there on spiking time scales, it's on the order of one millisecond, all the simulate, all the overhead that you have to account for slows it down by 100x. So 100 milliseconds is needed to simulate one millisecond of real uh, biological neural network activity. So it would be possible to do exactly that same function in an electronic, an optoelectronic substrate that does that collection of 10,000 inputs, computation of whether to produce a spike or not, and then deliver it to the 10,000 outputs. Um, using actually the physics of the devices that are embedded in the system. So a lot of the computation is done by the network elements themselves rather than having digital representations of them. And that um, sort of local computation is driven by the system itself. There isn't a separate program or another computer outside somewhere that's instructing how the system to update itself. And that leads to potentially on the, on the order of tens of femtojoules and about one ten thousandth of real time. So that's three orders of magnitude in terms of energy that's needed for that sort of basic function of what, what a neuron does. And about four to five orders of magnitude in, in time for being able to do those computations. And again, this, these are just um, rough estimates, order of magnitude estimates of what might be possible. Um, there is actually a system that's being, has been built and is actually is being made available more, more widely right now through the European Union Human Brain Project. Um, there's a neuromorphic platform that uh, one of the groups at Heidelberg, Heidelberg University has put together with, actually it's a very large uh, consortium, with a large level of activity. And there's another system that's at the University of Manchester led by Steve Ferber, this is led by uh, Carlos Meyer. And th they are actually being able, they are doing this sort of combination of digital and somewhat analog functions at eight inch wafer scale for the Heidelberg system and a board scale with ARM processors in, in the Manchester system. Um, and they are providing actually some of these early um, data points in terms of time scale and energy required for, for these kinds of systems. So it's, this, this is actually a very important point in terms of being able to do further experiments on a platform that you have to test any hypothesis you might have for a neural system. If it is going to take you 100x in terms of time, let's say a day of running of the biological neural network will take 100 days to simulate. And you, to, to be able to get statistics, you actually need maybe hundreds or if not thousands of runs of that particular setup. That's not tractable. You will not be able to do that in, in a reasonable time frame. However, if you do build a system that can go 
much faster than real time. Then you do have the option of being able to set those parameters, let things run, generate statistics, and then go back and forth. Um, so as, as a test platform, as something that you can go in and test things on, this is a clear necessity. Um, otherwise, you, you just don't have the platform to, to test your ideas on. So the two key enabling concepts, I want to sort of wrap them back up a little bit. Um, you do need massive air connectivity. You, you do need to be able to reach over a thousand inputs in your network coming into a single node, and you need to be able to reach to a thousand others, and this needs to be plastic. You need to be able to adjust those connections, weights, whatever needs to be adjusted on the fly. And ideally at the lowest level possible. So let's say a transistor or a memory element or a link device itself is providing you that adjustability in the network rather than having another computer outside that's keeping a database of what those connection weights are and doing updates. And that again people have tried people are trying to do that. The, the, the overhead of trying to manage that in a conventional computing approach is, is pretty proving to be uh, intractable. Uh, the other key concept is that the information is represented <coughs> in this sparse spatial temporal uh, hierarchical representation scheme. Um, and the correlation of that activity is really what represents the information and does the computation in terms of being able to predict what pattern is going to activate next. Um, so just a uh, rough sketch of what a structure like this, what a, what a substrate like this might look like on the optoelectronic side. Um, what we're thinking about building is a unit cell that has some of the local functionality that is, that, that's built in that does the um, local mathematical operations, let's say, and has optical and electrical local and medium range inputs and also it has long range outputs and inputs. Um, and if you really squint hard and tilt your head a little bit, this, this, is, this looks like a cortex. I don't think it's going like that. <laughs> um, where, where some of the ideas for the structures coming out from is uh, um, uh, the cortical column, sort of the uh, micro column, macro column ideas and the hierarchical temporal memory that's been talked about in literature for quite some time. Jeff Hawkins and several other uh, uh, researchers and authors in this area have talked about how a structure like this and that sparse spatial, uh, spatial temporal representation is at the core of being able to do cortex-like or, or brain-like functions. And uh, what we expect is going to be needed is uh, 3D hybrid integration on the optoelectronics through solar GPS and novel devices to actually to be able to build a system like this. Uh, again, I, I'll show you just a few examples of what those devices might look like, but again, by no means, these, those are the only ones that are, um, there's a lot of activity and development on just the microelectronics side by itself that's being driven, again, by conventional computing uh, needs, but we're finally leveraging those very closely to this approach as well. Again, the key characteristics that are embedded in the structure are the plasticity and adaptability at the device level. So you're not trying to do that adaptability by some other means in, in another computer. Uh, and the massive interconnect and pan out that's necessary. You do have to be able to reach out to 1,000 plus, ideally 10,000 inputs into one unit, and that one unit out to 10,000 others. That, that seems to be a critical requirement. So now I've talked so much about this, I, I need to <coughs> give you guys a visual of what this thing looks like. Unfortunately, I can't do that right now for, for lack of my uh, graphical arts abilities, but we're working on a simulation. <laughs> and the simulations of this actually exist on several different projects. The Human Brain Project, there are several others that have generated incredible videos of what the sparse spatial temporal activation looks like. And it's, it's amazing, it's actually really, really neat to see. So what I'll 
have to ask you to do is just sort of close your eyes and imagine a 10 by 10 by 10 cube of elements. So that's what I'm calling here a brain cube. It's a small <coughs> column or whatever it is. It's not exactly the same thing. But now out of those thousand elements at any given time, only five or 10 are active. So we have these five or 10 flashes of light within a thousand that are activating in a certain pattern. And that pattern is actually predicting which pattern is going to come out next. And all of that activity is internally driven by that thousand element break cube itself. There is no external connection. There are no other programs driving that activity. So now imagine a 100 by 100 by 1 of those brain cubes. So that's a small element, let's say. That, that's about 10 to the 7 neurons, 10 to 10 million neurons. What people are starting to see in their simulations is that if, if you don't have about this level of population density, about a million to 10 million neurons in your simulation, you really can't get the emergent behavior that you expect from a neural network. So this network has to be massively interconnected, reconfigurable, and large enough to be able to do the things that, that the neural system is, is, is potentially doing. And now let's take it a little bit further out. A thousand by a thousand by a hundred of, the, of these brain cubes. And now you're at the level of 10 to the 11. That's 100 billion neurons, which is on the order of what the human brain has. Um, and on top of that, the, the, the other number that I'm not really showing you here is 10 to the 14. If you assume each neuron has about 1,000 or 10,000 synapses maybe, on average, again, this changes depending on which part of the brain you're in, you're up to 10 to the 14 to the 10 to the 15 things that, that, that are in that system that are actually active. Could you mind giving a general example of emergence in this, this scenario? So again, I'm, I'm going to define that very oh, loosely. Um, Maybe I'll just tie it back to the functionality I was talking about earlier in terms of a population of neurons that are, that are able to encode the information stream that's coming into them, be able to internally represent whatever that data stream is, and be able to predict what next element will be in that data stream. That's, let's say, the sensory part, the motor part actually has to be in there. So that part of that emergent behavior is it not only predicts what's going to happen next, but it has connections to the rest of the structure to drive function, whatever that function is. I, again, very, very loosely defined. So I, I again, that's um, maybe not as precise of a definition, but is, is that? Yeah. Okay, that's. Uh, so uh, now talking in a little bit more detail about specific devices that we might be able to use to build a structure like this. Um, these are some silicon nanowires that we have built in our facility at Sandia. Uh, these are silicon nanowires uh, that are on the order of 30 to 40 nanometers in cross section. Uh, and they stretch across anywhere from 2 to 5 to 10 microns in length. Um, and if, if you're familiar with transistors, um, this, is a, this is a source and a drain, and the gate is actually a silicon nanowire itself, which is shown in cross-section here. This is a, actually a cross-section TM where you can see individual silicon atoms, and it's really impressive. I, again, not my work in terms of TM, but I, it's always impressive to see that level of detail. Um, and what we've shown, what we're showing in this slide over here, this part of the slide here, is uh, these devices actually work beautifully as P-type and N-type transistors. So you can actually put a voltage here, put a voltage here, and then use this electrostatic gate to control how much current goes across the wire. And again, that's standard device uh, uh, transistor operation. That, that's very exciting in its own right. But what we're what we'd really like to do with a structure like this is then add a few more layers of uh, compound semiconductors, which uh, 
One, one silicon is incredible the material, so I, I'm a little bit of a uh, silicon uh, bias person myself. <laughs> but one thing silicon can't do is emit light. So if you're able to put materials around silicon in critical places, that will let you then generate light or absorb light or modulate light. Now you have a very, very critical functional block that you can replicate and potentially build the system that I was talking about earlier. Um, so what, what this device potentially lets you do is that massive interconnectivity and path that I was mentioning earlier. If you're trying to take thousand things, ten thousand things, and get input from them into a single node, being able to use optics is, is a critical ability. Um, if you try to do this electronically, as I had mentioned before, you, you very quickly run out of physical space to be able to connect enough wires to be able to make that happen. So um, one uh, really good thing about optics photons is that they can actually squeeze in and you can actually pack a lot of information on that optical stream that you normally can't do on an electronic uh, interconnect. So I've gotten to uh, quite a bit of detail about how we might build a neuro-inspired computing system. Now, let's say we build such a thing. What are the two things that you can do with that? What, what would you be able to do? study and understand further details of how neural systems might work. This is actually that platform I was mentioning in terms of being able to set up things and test hypotheses and pass enough time and, and enough energy efficiency so you don't need a nuclear reactor right next to your platform to run all the calculations that you need. And the second thing you can do is you can actually pick the best abilities that are described to the neural system to the brain, being able to predict, being able to adapt, being able to learn, and use them to analyze predictive control systems in ways that we currently can't do in terms of power, speed, size, and functionality. Uh, so again, I'll, I'll talk about this, the second one in a little more detail. The first one Again, in its own right, is a huge endeavor. The Human Brain Project and some of the other projects, the Brain Initiative here, um, are tailored towards being able to do that. How do you study the brain with higher efficiency, better access to data, with better tools to be able to, to, to run your hypotheses across so you can actually get, get the answers you're looking for? Um, and number two, this is actually more in terms of how do we build new computing systems. Just to delve into this a little bit further, I'm going to pull a little bit from history. I know if you've actually seen these images before, but this is this is Wright Brothers' first wind tunnel. When they started building their first gliders, they were using data sets mostly available just in the literature and building their wing cross-sections and their overall structures based on that, and, and they weren't getting the performance they were expecting. It was just not working out. So they decided to build their own test setup, put their own wing cross-sections, and run their tests and build their own data set. And actually, they did. They, these were, uh, one side they would put their test cross-section, the other side is a drag plate, and as you pedal down the road, let's say about five miles an hour or so, you can see this angle difference based on the drag and, and, and the lift. Um, and with this equation, then you can pull out what the performance of that wing cross section is. They very quickly realized running down the street at five miles an hour and trying to measure this angle wasn't all that practical. So a, they did build a wind tunnel after this, but this is how they started. So this is really what we're trying to do. <coughs> We need to build test systems where we can actually take hypotheses, take structures, whatever they are, put them into tests, get our results, and be able to iterate as quickly as possible and as, as high efficiency as possible. Um, again, 
you can do you can do this through software. You can do this through software on, let's say, uh, uh, tweaked digital systems, and you can also do this on dedicated neuro-inspired or, or neuromorphic systems. And this is starting to happen uh, all over the world right now. Um, in terms of where that initial test setup led to, this is, this is what happened in about 60 to 70 years, or let's say maybe about 100 years here. So this is, again, very, very exciting. If, if you have the capability to run the tests, start learning faster and faster, um, we might be able to do some really amazing things. Um, so this took, let's say, 70 years, 100 years. What would be your prediction in terms of having new electronic, new neuromorphic systems once we start experimenting with them? How quickly could we advance? Where could that lead to? So now that we've talked about the two things to do with it, which is to understand the brain and build new systems to analyze and predict behavior of systems, control systems, there's one question that's left. What will happen next? This is again going back to the prediction. How do we do that prediction based on the data that's available to you? Uh, same question, what will you do? And what will I do? Um, just coming back to the goal, again, we'd like to analyze, predict, and control systems in ways that currently is not possible. And one of the key Functions, one of the key outcomes is to be able to predict the future in engineered systems, in, in physical systems, in the most efficient manner possible. So what, what are some of the applications uh, systems like these uh, could, could help in? Uh, there are lots of sensor systems where the number of pixels are just going beyond imagination. There are gigapixel cameras, multi-gigapixel cameras out there. The amount of data that's coming in um, is, is horrendous. You just can't analyze them in, in, in the ways that we've analyzed them before. Same, same thing goes for unmanned remote systems, let's say UAVs or robots. If you'd like to be able to have those things functional when they don't have a connection to a large computing infrastructure, you need to be able to instantiate that control and prediction functionality <coughs> in the system itself. Um, Again, this is a little bit more on the computing side, the big data, data uh, cyber problems where problems look like graph problems. There's some inter interesting things um, that, that are appearing in, in that application space. Again, looking at complex adaptive systems where you're trying to simulate large collections of, of very complex elements in the first place. And then this is um, going back to that test platform idea where where you are looking to connect into neural systems where you have neural interfaces, be it cochlear implants, retinal implants, whatever they are. Um, and neuroscience, being able to understand how the, how the neural system works. Um, again, this is going back to the wind tunnel analogy. We need to be able to, uh, we need to, be able to test our ideas quickly enough and efficiently enough if we want to proceed on down that path. So, I, didn't go too much into detail about Moore's law and limits. Um, so this is standard microelectronics in terms of how quickly the uh, computing uh, microelectronics uh, capabilities evolve over time. Um, this has been an incredible ride. Uh, the, the computing power has doubled almost every 18 months initially. First every 12 months, now 18 months. And that's been commonly referred to as Moore's law. And, and it's, brought a lot of the efficiency, a lot of the uh, practical improvements that we've seen over the last four or five decades. But it it is on the verge of saturating. It actually has saturated at, at, at least three times. And right now we're at the point we might not be able to push it any further. And the reason, there are three reasons for those limits. And, and I'll, I'll just give very brief descriptions of what, what they are. One is physics. Um, again, here 
is another transportation analogy. The trains that evolved over from the very first one out to the biggest ever machines that are out there, um, they have a single limiting physical factor, and that's right there. The amount of weight you can put on an axle before you start damaging the tracks. You can build bigger engines, you can put more weight on them, but you can't really make the system function if you're destroying it as we're trying to make it work. This is the same limit for microelectronics. We've gotten to the point where our devices have gotten so small that the amount of energy we're putting into them to drive them to do a computation is actually causing them to start producing errors. So uh, this is, actually there are several different ways. People have seen this over time. The, the, the clock frequency of CPUs have saturated quite some time ago, around three to four gigahertz. You might be able to push and play some tricks, get a little bit more, but it doesn't give you that much more performance. There's a thermal design limit, is another actually physical limit. If you try to switch all the transistors that are available to you in the latest node uh, process that's available, you'll actually melt your device. So there are limits put on to a, a, a circuit in terms of how much of it you can activate at any given time. And this is also commonly referred to as dark silicon. You just can't run every single transistor that you can build in a silicon chip right now. So there are some architecture things that people are doing to get around those problems, but again, this is one physics limit. That's one of the limits. The other one is actually economics, which is actually the real reason we might not be able to push any further. Um, so Gordon Moore was uh, chairman of uh, Intel, and it was his actually paper back in the 60s where he mentioned increase in transistor count and performance available per unit area of silicon. And that that has what's been commonly referred to as Moore's Law. And his comment um, somewhat further down in, in, in time was that Moore's Law scaling, device scaling, will not end because of physics. It will end because of economics. <coughs> the amount of money that's required to build the latest and greatest fabrication facility, the fabs, was on the order of $7 billion, and it's going over $10 billion potentially for the next generation. Could be even more. That level of capital outlay and the amount of revenue you can generate at some point will not justify that initial investment. Again, this, this is driven by quite a few things on the tool com complexity, the tools that are required to process the silica, the costs associated with them, and the costs associated with running the whole, whole facility. So again, this is one of the other limiters in terms of what our conventional computing machines might be able to do at, at the limit. And the third one is one of functionality. Again, this is somewhat a controversial statement. Again, we can talk about it more uh, after the presentation. A symbolic computation approach, basically a Turing machine, might not be able to do the functions we want efficiently enough for the next generation analysis, prediction, and control systems. Uh, again, this is just a prediction, not a, a very definitely, very much open to debate. Uh, but this goes back to the idea of being able to use a supercomputer to simulate a brain. You might be able to do it, but it will require more than 20 megawatts, maybe 100 megawatts of power input, and a very large computing center, a very large uh, data center to be able to accomplish that function for one brain. Again, might be possible. I would argue maybe not. And even if you did, is it efficient enough? What will it give you? Will it be the things that you're really looking for that you want to be able to deploy many environments and many places. So I hope I was able to talk through these slides and give you an idea of why you would want to consider neuroinspired neuromorphic systems for next generation control and analysis systems, prediction systems. And some ideas about how we're going to build these neuroinspired systems. And just a few points about what are we really going to do with them. 
So I'd like to end up with one last slide. What we're really going to do with those is actually what I said at the beginning of the talk. This is something Feynman said uh, back in 1983. And I think this is true. And I think this is very true. So with that, I, I was able to entertain you, at least mildly, for, for a little bit. And again, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Okay, now we have a chance to ask all the burning questions that we have about how brains and computers to learn from one another. I, I, I will, again, make one, I'll provide one caveat. I'm not a neuroscientist. That's okay. And That's I don't okay. play one on TV either, but... Okay. <laughs> that function by using a memristor or some other device that gives you that functionality by just the physics of the device itself. So you don't have to reach across to a memory bank, pull three bits, four bits, whatever it is, and load it into that location to achieve that function. So memristors are potentially very interesting and exciting. Um, uh, there are potentially other types of devices that either go into that sort of people that made analogies for memristors as synapses. So that, that's one possible way. There are other ways potentially memristors could be used. Um, again, the electronic only devices, they will give you, I believe, part of the function. You need to be able to do the massive interconnectivity and, and kind of that pan out at the same time to actually achieve the, those uh, performance goals, I think. And that's achieved by the whole thing, the hybrid Yes. Yes. I think there is a same question. So when you build it, it looks like you have you use the new device or the device and have no connection, no connections. But are you still based on little ones in two space or two buildings or no? No, no. That's actually a really good question. The the zero and ones will still be around, we'll still be using in zeros and ones to maybe do certain functions in that local structure. But what really is representing the data is the correlated activation of those individual units, that sort of brain cube analogy was, or that image that I was trying to convey. So it's actually that five or six or 10 things that are lighting up in a certain pattern. That's the representation of data. That's how computation is done. That's how memory storage, or I should say memory storage and recall is done. It's, it's actually that, they, that new, uh, data representation that's inherently in the structure itself, not the zeros and ones that are actually representing the data. That's, that's actually a really good question. So, is there a theory for that? Like, for that kind of representation, computational theory? Of yeah. So, um, again, I'm not a mathematician, <laughs> but there are theories that have evolved over time looking at ultra high dimensionality spaces. So 1,000, 10,000. Oh, infinite. Uh, uh, <laughs> it might be a little bit hard, at least for me. Uh, but so there's, there's a uh, uh, researcher, Kanti Kaverna, um, which I believe is uh, associated with UC Berkeley right now. There, there are a couple other institutions that he's been associated with. But some of his early work, where he was considering 1,000, 10,000 dimensional spaces and how representation and computation might be carried out in those kinds of setups. Yeah, I'm talking about something like quantum computers, right? 
they virtually exist or virtually don't exist, but the theory for them is there, right? We at least know if they would have existed, here's how we would do sorting, and here's how we would do search. So I'm talking about something like that, because the problem is even parallel computing, which we have access to now, we're not using it, because we don't know how to program it most of it. With your system, do we have to like spend 10 or 21 years training it, like uh, bringing it up to speed with life? <laughs> Like we usually do. We, that we usually do. In my case, it took 40 years. Much um, but that actually is a really good tie into what I was mentioning in terms of faster than real time. If you're able yeah, to. Yeah, so if it's we need much faster than real time, right? So you, you need to be able to expose it to the data streams, the environment that it needs to see to form those internal representations. And then you can predict, start predicting. So there is no programming like that. It's That's just like you throw it in and hope that it will figure out. Well, sink or swim? Yeah, may maybe, maybe. Now, there, there are um, certain cases where you might be able to prepare the system to a certain level of maturity, let's say for lack of a better word, and then it can do certain functions maybe from that point on without having to be trained that much more. But it, it really is a shift in paradigm in terms of there is no hardware, software, boundary. Hardware and software are the same thing, it's just that one system that's doing the function internally itself. And the, the way to get it to that functionality level is there are some inherent things that we'll be able to do, but it needs to be exposed to those input streams, whatever they are, to be able to then start predicting and acting on what it needs to do. Sounds like a very difficult problem. I'm sorry. Like, uh, like those interfaces would be a lot of work. Yes, yes yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, so well, some of the so some of the work that I've mentioned in terms of uh, actually just, hmm? <laughs> neural, neural connections. Actually, that's another connection in terms of, I had the great chance of working on a random left knot project that was also at, at San Diego, a larger DOE effort with, with medical partners as well. Um, again, that actually led to some of the thoughts that have led to this. How do you encode the information that's coming into your retina? And not only that, how does it get your, your retina does a huge amount of pre-processing. You're not sending back XY Cartesian images from your retina to your V1 or other visual centers. It's, um, it's six, seven, or eight different streams that encode contrast, motion, color, correlation. So those pre-processing functions are done on the retina and then it's then provided to the rest of the system. So going to those interfaces, how do you provide the right linkage so that you're not, so Usually my analogy was with the retinal implant, we're taking this, this really fine Swiss watch and hammering it to make the second hand tick back and forth, which is, it works. It's actually an amazing project. Patients are able to see spots of light about the size of a quarter at an arm's length, and they're able to get some uh, unaided mobility, some semblance of vision, not the vision what you would call what we see, but at least some sense of what objects are around them so they can move around unaided. Um, so things like that where how that information is represented and encoded in the first place, kind of how it gets fed into the rest of the system, and then how, how it comes out of the system, which in this case it's uh, pressure waves, but there, there might be other ways of getting that information across. Uh, it's, it's, it's a really, really interesting problem. So IBM built challenge. those chips uh, recently, right? I forgot what they call it. Yeah, the true north um, architecture. Is it related to what you're saying? Or? It is related, actually. That was a product of the uh, Synapse program out of DARPA. And they did actually do some very uh, important and early work in this direction. How do you take the neural structure information? How can you pull out some of the functional characteristics? And can you then pull out algorithms that ride on top of those architectures and then implement them for, <coughs> let's say, UAVs, robotics? vision analysis systems, whatever they happen to be. Do they have an application? I saw those chips, but I don't know if they're in so, any of the systems and so have yeah, they implemented anything on them. So they have done some work, and that's actually one of the projects they were involved in earlier was uh, uh, Vision, where they were actually taking video feeds and doing object tracking uh, with actually very impressive power and performance. Yeah, that's the yeah. example I saw, surveillance cameras that don't need a lot of power that can just 
the so solar power and the yeah. uh, yeah. process and sand and everything. So th those have been some early examples of how architectures like these might be used. Now, I, I'd say it's a really good step, but I don't think it goes as far as necessary to maybe enable some of the functions that I'm talking about here in terms of being able to learn and being able to predict, being able to adapt on the fly with low power. Well, no, they got no power, right? yeah, they, they, they and actually, apparently they know how to train those. Like, do you, if, I, yeah. I don't know. If I'm the, the only one asking questions. Sorry. I'm interested. How they train those? So, it, like, yeah. okay, we have a case. This is a hy hy hypothetical example, right? Well, if we have it, we will emerge it and it will train. But they have a case of something that they implemented on a yeah. hardware, yeah. and they've trained it apparently to so recognize they, images. So they, they train it on a software emulation of the hardware, so they don't do it on the fly. So they actually have a bit exact copy of that hardware in a simulation environment. So they can actually run it through what it needs to do for the training set to, let's say, mature. And then once it's established, then they can take that and then put it onto the hardware. And the hardware can now run at incredibly low power. No, so hardware doesn't train. Hardware is fixed in a sense. It's not a, it's not a processor it's in the, it's not a configurable thing. Yeah, it's, it's not a, self-learning or self-adapting, at least in, in the way yeah. it's prepared. You might be able to implement some functions that give you some adaptability, but not inherently at the lowest level. At the right. lowest level of the device, as far as I can understand. 